So this is what a torn down garage looks like. On the left we have the old studs and on the right we have the roof rafters. This was a skillion roof and they're all native Aussie eucalypt hardwood 125 by 50 wide. We'll be using these to make us a dining table today. G'day guys, welcome back. Today we're making a dining table for a friend. This is a gift because she is an awesome person. She's our neighbour and you've got to look after your neighbours, right? Anyways, um, we have the roof rafters, these guys here, from an old garage teardown that were gifted to me and they are a dense red Aussie hardwood. A car drive through the middle of my conversation. Right, so these are the panels that we're going to use. These are the boards that we're going to use to make up the panel, the tabletop, and then we're going to put some breadboard ends on it because breadboard ends are cool and they say quality. It's been about two years since I filmed that and those breadboard ends turned out to be quite a bad idea. Keep watching and we'll find out why. Um, so we've cut it down to rough length. The next step is we've got to mill it flat. But before we do that, we're going to get the old metal detector out. Before we do that, we're going to get the old metal... Please, I'm filming! Before we do that, we're going to get the old metal detector out. And, oh really, are you serious? And make sure there's no metal in it. Clamps. Yeah, make sure there's no nails or screws or anything in it. Because if there is, it would really suck. The process we're going to follow is, we're going to go over to the planer over there, and we're going to get the bottom edge, flat, straight, smooth, untwisted, nice, beautiful. Then we're going to run the flat edge up against the joint of fence and get the flat face up against the joint of fence and get this mating edge 90 degrees to that face, flat, straight, smooth. Then we're going to go to the table saw and get this rough edge cut off, make them all the same size. Then we're going to go back through the thicknesser and get the top smooth, flat, consistent. Then we're going to domino. Then we're going to glue. Let's make it happen now. Let's, 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 let's make it happen now. Milling is complete. We have our panel here, which will be our tabletop. And a couple of boards milled to the breadboards. Um, and I have the big triangle of love, joy, and not stuff up a nation. This helps you not mess up and put it back together in the same order. So um, I spared you most of that milling. So what I'm gonna do now is use some dominoes. Okay. There are people out there who feel it's necessary to keep telling me that I don't need to use the domino and that the domino is no good and that I'm so lucky for having one. Listen, please, please. On behalf of the remarkably prestigious reputation of the One Man Band Woodworks YouTube channel, I'd like to apologize for how much Fatty talks and for some of the things that he says. He used to eat vegetables. I worked very hard. I started with nothing. This is not where my workshop was. It was in the lean-to shed over there. The roof is this high. I literally used to assemble kitchens in this position. Bit by bit, I upgraded as I fed my family, put some aside in savings, put some aside for tax, insurance, expenses. There was a little bit left over, which I kept parking until it became big enough to buy a tool. When I ascertained that a tool was gonna to make my business go forward, reduce customer cost, increase productivity, and not reduce quality, that's when I bought one. I do run a business, a $2,000 domino makes a lot of sense. It makes, it allows me to produce the same product for cheaper without dropping quality. So please, shut up. So now I'm gonna domino, glue, joint. And the only reason I use the dominoes is so that we don't get this sort of rocking and unlevelification because this is really hard hardwood and it's going to be very hard to sand flat. For a very brief time in my life, I had access to a $20,000 wide drum belt sander. And here's what it looks like doing maybe four hours worth of sanding and planing in a, the space of 10 minutes. 
Actually, I don't think it was that long. Maybe seven minutes. Perfectly flat, smooth. Wow. I think my head's getting chopped off, isn't it? Sorry. So this is now back from the um, workshop. He was a friend of mine's workshop and he let me use his drum sander and it's drum sanded it to sheer flat perfection. Look at the flatness. It's incredible. It's unbelievable. It's inconceivable. Seriously. This was also a terrible idea because the track saw actually wandered through the cut and right at the very end when I'm showing you a close up of these breadboards you can see how far the breadboard has not come into contact with the surface. So it looks like it's doing a nice straight easy cut but it's not, it's wandering all over the place. I mean, you've got the old uh, Trojan ruler here, nothing but the best, nothing but the best on this channel. Square those lines up now. One here. What was the other one? I think it was here. Middle. So these are my tenon locations. We'll plunge those now. Okay guys, you can just see me there with some extra wide custom made dominoes that I'm gluing into the table. These get glued into the table but just draw board into the breadboard itself. They don't get glued to the breadboard because we want to allow for seasonal movement. Only that middle tenon, that really wide one, it's 100mm wide, that gets glued in on both sides because the middle's not going to move, it's going to move to the left and to the right. And I just cut those extra wide slots by shimming the domino machine side to side using the pencil marks. Used something that was mechanically that different in the middle tenon. If you're still listening, you can have a free Louis point. If you haven't scrubbed past and fast forwarded and brushed me off like I'm nothing. Okay, now I'm just using the dowel max to drill the hole for the, um, the dowel that is going to draw bore and connect. You can see I've scored a little center line, which I'm matching to my pencil line. And you may have noticed before, I'm putting a little um, scrap block inside of my uh, slots as I drill. The reason for that is if you don't do that, you blow out, see there's that center line, you blow out the inside of your hole. And I got this piece stuck in there and uh, it was pretty annoying. But yes, that little scrap block stops the inside of your hole blowing out and becoming a big mess. And with the Dalmax, oh wow, I surprise myself sometimes. You get real good precision on this sort of thing and your hole is straight and clean. Well, I, yep, very romantic. Can you feel the passion? And yes, I'm still getting that stuck in there. Now I'm just transferring those hole locations through with a drill bit and a pencil because the drill bit was like not pointy enough on the tenons. And there they are. So I'm setting my marking gauge to make a scratch where they are currently. And then I use the dowel max and I align the center of the dowel max with that line. 
and that washer is how far forward of center I want to be. I want to be offset so that the dowel pulls the breadboard in and see that? There it is. So using the dowel max to do this is like cheat codes. Normally you would just do it freehand, but this is so much more accurate and consistent. It's just going to drill a perfect hole in exactly the right spot. You can see how it's offset forward of center. And now I'm going to widen that hole and turn into a slot and there's our lateral movement for seasonal adjustment beautiful now remember guys glue only on the middle one thanks for that joey and there's my jandals by the way with a very painfully filmed montage of me hammering these dowels in i tried to sort of be creative with it did you see how they bend and pull in as they go through that's really cool so i'm leaving them sticking slightly proud except for that one because we only want to glue the very top of the dowel. We don't want to glue the dowel to the tenon. So out of shot there, gluing the top of the dowel. Just out of shot there, gluing that one. And we're finally in shot. And that's what we're trying to do. Just glue the very top of the dowel. Thanks. True story. I found it in the, like dumped on the side of the road. Now I'm removing these Corner connectors, the knockdown fittings they're called. These things don't work. I've never seen a table not wobble with these things on. And don't believe the lie, it's not there to make it easy for you to move it in and out of your home, because you can fit a table through any doorway by going through on the angle. It's just there to make it cheaper to transport for them, not for you. So I'm getting rid of those, replacing with mortise and tenons. And here I'm just rounding the edges off with the router and you can see I've put this big plywood auxiliary base plate on which makes it much easier for you to round over. I see quite a few YouTubers and like some really good respected ones guys who have a domino and dust extraction and they don't use the dust extraction. I don't get it. Why would you do that? Why? Your cutters last half as long you put dust all over the place. Why? Why? Back to work. All right. Should I test fit or just glue together and hope for the best? Option B, I reckon. So the table has been living here in the customer's house with a big tablecloth over it for two weeks. The bottom's varnished, the top's unsealed and has a tablecloth on it and the breadboard ends are holding it straight. Now the reason I've done that is to allow it to acclimatise in situ. So these breadboards were all cut flush and have a look at that now. We've got about a three millimetre overhang on every single one of them. So the timber has obviously shrunk a great deal in this way. The breadboards have allowed it to move and stay straight. There's a little bit of cupping here where the, the board has lifted. The actual tabletop has lifted. Um, but that's going to be all the movement now. So now I'm going to sand it all flush again. And this time I'll finish it. So this is quite possibly one of the worst timber finishing montages ever filmed. Really just didn't go to plan. Um, yeah, it's 
a bit cringy, a bit difficult to watch. Anyway, you can just see it's just like sucking up absolutely everything I pour onto it, and I can't get a consistent coat. Um, it's just an awful finish. I just could not get this wood to finish nicely. See how it's opened up, even where I've um, epoxied it and stuff like that. So here's the finished result two years later. You can see the mismatch on those breadboard end, ends. It's quite terrible. So I'm going to take this table back, completely sand it back down, trim the ends flush again, and refinish it for her. Now that it's finally stable, it shrunk a total of 10 mil on both sides. That's a total of two centimeters. So goodbye and thanks for watching and allow my failure here to burn into your retinas until we meet again on this same project. Donald! Ouch, that's one for the wife. She's savage.